Today we will explain what is a response spectrum and how we can use it to evaluate earthquake forces on buildings. In order to discuss the response spectrum, we need first to understand what is a natural period of a structure. If we push a structure horizontally, then we remove the acting force to allow the structure to vibrate freely. The time needed by the structure to make a complete free vibration cycle is called the natural time period. The value of the natural time period depends on the properties of the structure, mainly its mass and stiffness. When the mass increases, the time period also increases. Heavy buildings vibrate slower than light buildings. On the other hand, when the stiffness increases, the time period decreases. Short buildings are stiffer than tall buildings, therefore short buildings vibrate faster than tall buildings. For a one-story single degree of freedom system, the natural time period is equal to 2 pi multiplied by the square root of m over k. Why are structures affected by earthquakes? If we have a very light building with negligible mass and the building is subjected to an earthquake motion at the base, the building as a whole will move back and forth following the exact motion of the earthquake, but no force will be generated in the building. In other words, the building will not be affected structurally by the earthquake as long as its mass is very small. Now let's add a considerable mass at the top of the building and see what is going to happen. When we subject the building to an earthquake motion at the base, the building will not move as one unit as before. There will be a difference in motion between the top of the building and its base. This is similar to what happens to a person in a train when the train moves suddenly. This difference in motion between the base and the top is called the relative displacement and it is this relative displacement that causes forces to be generated in the building. In summary, the effect of the earthquake on the structure is mainly dependent on the relative displacement U and not on the displacement of the base D. Therefore, the response of the structure to earthquake is measured by the relative displacement. If we multiply the relative displacement U by the stiffness K, we obtain the shear force V, which is the force used for the design of the building. If we divide the shear force V by the mass of the building, we obtain the absolute acceleration A. In summary, if we multiply the relative displacement U by the value K over M, or equivalently by the square of the value 2 pi over t, we obtain the absolute acceleration, which is used to measure the response of the earthquake instead of the relative displacement. We prefer to use the acceleration instead of the relative displacement because we can directly obtain the design force by multiplying the acceleration with the mass of the building. In structural design, we are mainly interested in the maximum value of the force that occurs in the building. We are not concerned about the direction of the force or when does it happen. For a single degree of freedom system, the maximum response is mainly dependent on the natural time period of the structure. To demonstrate this fact, we need to draw a graph between the time period T and the maximum absolute acceleration that occurs in the structure. Consider a single degree of freedom building with mass M and the height of the building is adjusted to produce a natural time period of 0.2 seconds. Now we will subject this building to a specific earthquake E1. Then we will solve the structure to obtain the maximum acceleration that will occur due to this earthquake and we will record this value on the graph as shown. Next, we will change the height of the building without changing the mass so that the time period becomes 0.4 seconds and we will resolve the problem to obtain the new maximum acceleration. 
we continue this process by changing the natural time period and each time we solve to find the maximum acceleration to complete the graph as shown. This graph between the natural time period T and the maximum acceleration response is called the response spectrum curve for the earthquake motion E1. If any single degree of freedom building is subjected to the same exact earthquake motion E1, then we can obtain the maximum acceleration that could happen in this building due to this earthquake using this response spectrum curve. Suppose that the natural time period of the building was found to be 0.9 second, then we will locate this value in the x-axis and then we will obtain the corresponding maximum acceleration from the graph as shown. The maximum expected shear force can be computed by multiplying the maximum acceleration by the mass of the building. As stated earlier, the response spectrum curve constructed previously is specific to the earthquake motion E1. If another earthquake E2 is applied, then a different response spectrum curve will be obtained. In order to use the response spectrum curve, in the design at a certain location, we must draw the response spectrum curves for all the earthquakes E1, E2, E3, E4, etc. that is expected to happen in that location. And then we can draw an envelope response spectrum that can be used in the design. We call this envelope curve the design response spectrum curve and we call the maximum acceleration the spectral acceleration SA. So how do we obtain the response spectrum curves in practice? Do we need each time to analyze the structure for different earthquakes and find the envelope response spectrum as done earlier? In the majority of cases, we don't need to do that. If we know the location of the building and the type of the soil, we can use one of the national codes such as ASCE 7 or the Euro code to draw the design response spectrum curve using simple equations. For example, if we are designing a building in New York City and the building is founded on very dense sand, which is soil type C, we can easily draw the design response spectrum curve using ASCE 7-10 code as follows. First, we use the maps in the code to find the earthquake parameters for New York City, which are the short period parameter, SS, the one second parameter, S1, and the long transition period, TL. Then we use these values along with the soil type to obtain the parameters FA and FV from the tables in the code. Finally, we use the obtained values to calculate two response parameters SDS and SD1, and two time periods TS and T0. The five obtained values SDS, SD1, T0, TS, and TL can be used to draw the response spectrum curve with the time period T on the x axis and the spectral acceleration SA on the y axis, as shown. So now that we have drawn the design response spectrum curve, how can we use it to evaluate the design earthquake force? Let us look at a design example using ASCE 7-10. The following one-story single degree of freedom building is located in New York City and founded on very dense sand, so we can use the response spectrum curve drawn in the previous step. The building consists of ordinary concrete moment frames so the response factor R will be equal to 3 according to the code. R is a factor used to convert the elastic response of the building to an equivalent in elastic response and depends mainly on the ductility of the structural system. The weight of the building is 1900 kN, so the mass is evaluated to be 194 kN second square per meter. The building is residential, so the importance factor is equal to 1. First, 
we will analyze the x direction. The time period in the x direction is calculated using a computer model and is found to be 0.65 seconds. We use the response spectrum curve to find the corresponding spectral acceleration, SA, which was found to be 0.124 g. g is the acceleration of gravity. To evaluate the earthquake force in the x direction, we multiply SA by the mass M to find the elastic response. Then we divide by the factor R to convert it to the inelastic response. Finally, we multiply by the importance factor I to account for the building importance. The final result was found to be 79 kN. We repeat the same procedure for the Y direction. The spectral earthquake design force was found to be 122 kN in the Y direction. A final requirement of the ASCE 7-10 code is to calibrate the results obtained using the response spectrum analysis with that obtained using the equivalent lateral force method. The equivalent method produced a design earthquake force of 140 kN in both the X and Y directions. According to the code, the spectral force should be at least 85% of that obtained using the equivalent lateral force method. So the minimum earthquake force should be 119 kN. The final design seismic force using the response spectrum analysis will be 119 kN in the X direction and 122 kN in the Y direction. In this lecture, we have shown how to design a single story, single degree of freedom building using the response spectrum method. But what about a multi-story building? A multi-story building is a multi-degree of freedom structure that have more than one natural time period in each direction. A three stories building, for example, have at least three natural time periods in each direction. Therefore, the response of this building to earthquake motion will be a complex combination of responses. God willing, the seismic design of multi-story buildings using response spectrum analysis will be explained in a separate lecture.